Hi, I'm Lawanda, and I want to take you on a journey that my late husband and I started many years ago. And it's on the truth and identity of the Black people, particularly those who are called African Americans and those whose ancestors came through the transatlantic slave trade. So I hope that you keep your mind open, that you keep your heart open, and that you prayerfully ask our Creator to show you truth and your identity. Don't you see what's happened to me? I don't know my identity. I don't know my identity. Don't you see what's happened to me? I don't know my identity. We pray, but do we need to look deeper and see what the scriptures say? Was it stolen? Is it hidden? Can I find some place where it is written? Can the people come together that's so far apart without knowing where to start? We are confused, used, and abused. We hear many things, but it doesn't bring a solution or conclusion or anything. When we look around, where's the truth to be found? And why is it okay that we should be treated this way? We've had many names with no consensus of which one to claim. What a shame! Don't you see what's happened to me? I don't know my identity. Everyone else knows the land of their father, but they tell us we don't need to bother. I'm not out for fame or notoriety. I only want to know so I can be me. How long has this secret been going on? How long do you think we can hold on? Tell me the plan so we can stand in your favor again. Do we need to confess some of the mess in our lives so we can do more than barely survive? You knew from long ago how all this would go. At this very hour, I need your power so I could be free to be me. But I can't because don't you see what's happened to me? I don't know my identity. Why is the identity of the African-American people and all those whose ancestors that are part of the African diaspora or the transatlantic slave trade such a mystery? Why were we dispersed throughout the nations, scattered throughout the four corners of the earth, in the Americas, the Caribbean, Europe, such countries as the United States, Brazil, Haiti, Jamaica, Colombia, Cuba, Dominican Republic, the United Kingdom, and many other countries? Is identity even important? There has never been a slavery in the history of the world quite like this slavery. We can talk about the physical brutality, but the worst thing about this slavery had to do with taking the identity. First, they took your name. Then they took your language. Then they took your religion. Then they took your family. Then they took your history. Nothing is more powerful than taking your identity because when your identity get messed up, it's passed on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So what is the real story behind the transatlantic slave trade? Can this story or prophecy be found in the scriptures? And if so, who do we allow to interpret those scriptures? Well, one of the things that's important is that we have to correct the hermeneutic. Hermeneutic means the way we interpret the scripture. They don't mind us having the Bible as long as they control how we understand it. As long as they control the hermeneutic, that's the game changer. You can have the Bible, but we're going to tell you what it means. We're going to tell you what it says, and we're going to tell you how to interpret it. The Black pulpit, unknowingly, in most cases, we are, we are guilty, and I'm guilty, of using a Euro hermeneutic or a Euro interpretation of the Bible. 
Every pastor I know has a copy of William Barclay commentary, Matthew Henry commentary, Interpreter's Bible commentary, and every other commentary that's been written by Euro men. Um, and I have them on my shelf today as we speak. And they have told us what salvation is. They have, they have told us what the gospel means. Mm -hmm. They have told us what the term brother means. Mm -hmm. And we have accepted their interpretation, their hermeneutic, unexamined. Mm -hmm. And so when we go to the scripture text and start studying to put together our, our sermons and our Bible studies, we use these commentaries that are inaccurate interpretations of the biblical text. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we have to get back to is reinterpreting the biblical text according to the way in which it was intended to be interpreted. Throughout scripture, it is clear that identity, the people group you are related to and who you are related to by blood is important. One of the many examples is the prophet Zephaniah, who traces his lineage. Zephaniah was the son of Cush, the son of Jedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. Depending on what scholars you believe, some may say that Cush was just a name, while others say that Cush was the son of Ham, who was also the son of Noah. Identity is important to the Creator. He lists out lineage throughout scripture, starting in Genesis with Adam. And after the flood, he tells us about Noah's sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and where they settled. In the King James Version, it says this about Japheth in Genesis 10, 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Genesis 10, 20. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Genesis 10, 31. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. Scripture calls the descendants of Japheth Gentiles. At times, the ancient term Grecian has also been used to mean Gentiles. We see this term used a few times in the Old Testament and a number of times in the New Testament when the Shemites explain the gospel to the Gentile nations. What's also interesting in Genesis 10 verse 3 is that God makes it clear that the Ashkenaz are descendants of Japheth. Like many other people who converted to Judaism, the Ashkenaz live in their European ancestral lands as well as Israel, the United States, and throughout the world. The descendants of Ham knew about the God of the Israelites, and as we know, they lived amongst one another, intermarried, blended in with one another, and they also fought against one another. The oldest painting of Jesus and the Israelites is said to have been from Rome, A.D. 320. However, during the Renaissance period from 14th to 17th century, the Europeans started to paint pictures of Jesus and the Hebrews in their image. It is common that history is altered and the truth lost, but there are times when the truth is exposed, although it can be a slow process and even a harder process to accept truth. Jesus says in Matthew 13, 52, then he added, every teacher of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from his storeroom new gems of truth as well as old. And what are our new gems of truth? One is the Hebrew name of God, our creator, and his son, Jesus, who died and rose again. This is certainly a new gem of truth for many of us, but not so for others. Where did the name God, Lord, and Jesus come from? The ancient Israelites, the descendants of Shem, would have no idea who we were talking about if we said God or Jesus. The word Jesus came from a Greek word, Jesus. And the Greek word Jesus was a Greek deity. 
And um, the word, as a matter of fact, the, the letter J was never in the original Hebrew language, nor the Greek language. J was never there. The, even today, the Hebrew alphabet has no J. The Greek alphabet has no J. The J was the last letter that was introduced into the English language late in the 1500s. And the J letter came because a Catholic monk by the name of Galilitos was experimenting with the eye and put the hook on the bottom of the eye and made it a J. And that's how the J letter came into the English language. So his name was never Jesus. His, his name was and is Yahshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. A black pastor once said, if you want to get black people worked up, all you have to do is say the name Yahweh instead of God. But why is that? Why would we be upset to learn the real name of our creator, the name he told us to call him, the one that we preach about every week and for others talk about daily? What's so offensive about knowing this truth? We give credit to various artists and we know their names. The creator of all things is the ultimate artist whose name should be known and used. He created the heavens and the earth, beautiful flowers, waters, plants, animals, and the miracle of a newborn child. Who would not want us to know the real name of our creator and what his many names mean? Who would benefit from changing our creator's name and disrespecting him? And who would suffer from not knowing? We really don't know the actual name of our creator or how to pronounce it. But although we may not know 100%, at least having the desire to be close to using the names we do know demonstrates a desire to give full reverence, respect, and honor and love to our Creator. Jeremiah 23, 27. God says, Yahweh, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Yahweh's people were using the name of a pagan god. Matthew 27, 46. When Jesus, or Yahshua, was dying on the cross, he cries out to the Creator. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, which means, My God, my God. We have seen the Hebrew name of God written in English as El, or Elohim, Yahweh, or YHWH. In Exodus 23:13, Yahweh says, pay close attention to all my instructions. You must not call on the name of any other gods, Elohims. Do not even speak their name. One could argue that the term God and Lord has a pagan origin. It's sad that people were used by evil forces to remove the name of the Creator and decide for themselves what was appropriate, rather than listening to the word of the Creator Himself, who wanted us to know Him intimately and His name. When Yahweh took up our forefathers out of the land and scattered us off all over the world, that land was rich and fertile. Everything remained there intact, the, the Hebrew, Scriptures, the scrolls, the sacred scrolls, and everything was there intact. At the time, it was not the United Nations. It was the League of Nations. They gathered up people from all over, Germany, Russia, Europe, and brought them into the land. And they settled in the land, rich and fertile. And what happened is, when they got there, all the sacred scrolls, everything was intact. And so they set out to master the language of the Hebrews. 
And they learned it well, so well, that when they begin to unfold scriptures from the scrolls to put it in book form, when they came to Yahweh's name, they said the name Yahweh was too holy for sinful man to utter. So they removed it and replaced it with Lord, God, Adonai. And because of this, that's all we were taught. That's all we knew. I've been in the ministry 55 years. And it's only nine years ago I came into the knowledge of Yahweh and his son, Yahushua. And you know, it, it, there's, 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 there's a, a, a question that Solomon, the rich man, the rich man, King asked, he said, what is his name and his son's name? If you know, could you tell? What is his name? Hallelujah. His name is not Jesus. His name is not God. He's Yahweh, the almighty creator, the one who made us. Malachi 1, 6, the Lord of heaven's armies says to the priest, a son honors his father and a servant respects his master. If I am your father and master, where are the honor and respect I deserve? You have shown contempt for my name. Here we see that Yahweh says that the priests, which today are also called priests or pastors or bishops, lead people away from truth and honor. Exodus 3, 14 through 15. Elohim replied to Moses, Ahiah, Asher, Ahiah, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Yahweh also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the Elohim of your ancestors, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Clearly, our creator did not give us the name God, but we use it because that's what we have been taught and that's what we are most comfortable with. When truths are missing, hidden, or stolen, everything turns upside down. The voices telling you that our Creator's name doesn't matter should be ignored. Yahweh told us that His name is holy and should be remembered, not changed, replaced, or ignored. So why do our churches ignore the name of the Creator of heaven and earth? Jeremiah 2.8 says, the priest did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who taught my word ignored me. The rulers turned against me, and the prophets spoke in the name of Baal, wasting their time on worthless idols. Again, it was the leadership, and even some of our spiritual leaders today, who turned the people from Yahweh. Not knowing the people is one thing, but not knowing yourself as a pastor and as a preacher is another thing. Is it just a vocation? Or is it actual calling? To realize that people, and, 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 and you can look at it on both sides, because our people, because of them not knowing themselves, has, has they, they, they develop a mindset where they, they look to the pastor like the pastor is God. And the pastor is not God. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a mentality that's destroying us. And therefore, then the pastor comes along and they feel that they have to act as God because if we say things like, my people, my church. Totally, totally wrong. As Ecclesiastes says, there is nothing new under the sun. Our modern-day priests, pastors, rabbis, and other teachers and leaders are not teaching the full truth. It's likely that many of them don't know themselves. Throughout Scripture, we see prophets and leaders who serve the Creator with their full heart, while many others led the people away from truth. When the truth is missing, it results in consequences that last for generations. So are many of our churches missing truths? And what else could our leaders and church leadership be ignoring?
there are over 85,000 predominantly black churches in the United States, an astronomically high number for people that represent roughly 12% of the population. Now, certainly when you, when you look back to scholarship by people like Benjamin E. Mays mm -hmm. in the 1930s and 40s, uh, Dr. Mays raised this issue. Is the black community over-churched? Are there too many churches in black communities? And I think he was looking at it particularly with this kind of calculus in mind. Are, are there more of these institutions than we can afford to support? At the same time that we have such great poverty in the African-American community. Why if, are there so many churches and why are we doing so badly as black people, as a group, despite the extreme number of churches? And do you think that there is a correlation between our high praise and our low productivity? Hmm. Now, let me see. This is a very uh, challenging uh, question. The church has been described as a hospital for sick people. So what then does an abundance of churches actually indicate? Are there so many churches in black neighborhoods because the people are sick or are the people sick because there are so many churches? Black people, while we have had a lot of suffering and had a lot of heartache and trial, we've had two institutions that have really sustained us, of course being the church and the institution, the college. Think about it. Where would black folk be without the church? Where would black people be without our faith in God? Good question. But to answer that question, we must first establish where black people actually are. Black folk in America in a world of trouble. Anybody that tells you that black folk are progressing in America is lying to you. You've been intentionally misled and misdirected. You've been sent down the wrong road. We are exactly, exactly where we were as black folk in this country. We're exactly where we were in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War. You have not moved not one iota in 140 years. And what you're doing is enjoying the fruits of the social illusion. On 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, in this country, you only had about 287,000 black people that were free out of almost four and a half million. The other four and a half million were enslaved all over America. Only, only 287,000 were free. And yet, out of those 287,000 black people, they had succeeded in acquiring one half of 1% of the nation's wealth. Now, here we are, 140 years later, in the richest nation on earth. 140 years later, you still own and, own and control one half of 1% of this nation's wealth. Is it true that there are too many churches? Or is it that the black church doesn't know why black people are doing so poorly as a group? We have to ask this question to the creator who gave us the beauty of creation and the complexities and design of the human body. So what's the question? Are we more sinful than others? Is it that God doesn't like us as much? Are we not smart enough to climb up as a whole or are we under some kind of a curse? In order to understand why these things are happening to us as a people, we first need to find out who are the Black people today whose ancestors came through the transatlantic slave trade. The descendants of Japheth eventually left the Hermetic African continent and migrated to Europe. However, the descendants of Ham and the descendants of Shem stayed within or near the Hamitic African Edenic regions. The Hamitic people occupied modern day Africa and other areas today that are referred to as the Middle East. Africa is considered to be the oldest inhabited territory on the earth with the human species originating from the continent. It is so large that countries such as China, America, India, Eastern Europe, Italy, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Switzerland can fit into this vast continent that is rich in countless and natural resources. 
Jesus describes how the children of Israel will be scattered and Jerusalem destroyed. Luke 21, 20 through 24. And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you will know that the time of its destruction has arrived. Those in Judea must flee to the hills. Those in Jerusalem must get out and those out in the country should not return to the city. For those will be days of God's vengeance and the prophetic words of the scriptures will be fulfilled. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. For there will be disaster in the land and great anger against this people. They will be killed by the sword or sent away as captives to all the nations of the world. And Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the period of the Gentiles comes to an end. God has allowed all three of Noah's sons to have prominence in the world. After the flood, the descendants of Ham ruled the world. In scripture, the descendants of Shem, with the focus on the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, ruled many territories and increased in numbers. As the common era, also known as AD, was approaching, the European descendants of Japheth would come into power. Today, they control powerful world governments, financial institutions and systems, manufacturing, technology, media and entertainment, the pharmaceutical industry, the food industry, and much more. An old map of an area called Negro Land in Western Africa shows the kingdom of Judah where some of the slaves were taken from. When you look at the book of Edris, not Ezra, Edris, it is in the Apocrypha, it's not a part of the original 66 book canon, so it's not considered divinely inspired. But it is a part of the traditional Ethiopian uh, Christian church. The book of Edris is in that. And in the book of Edris, I explain in the book, in the book of Edris, it talks about what could have happened to the 10 tribes, the 10 lost tribes of Israel. If you understand the Old Testament, we talked about the lost tribes of Israel and the New Testament from the book of 2 Chronicles on, we're dealing with two tribes throughout the entire Bible. We're dealing with the tribe of Benjamin and we're dealing with the tribe of Judah. The other 10 were lost in Assyria, in the Assyrian captivity. In the book of Edris, it talks about what happened to the to the captives to the to the ten of the to the ten lost tribes of Israel? It talked about how they decided that they were going to leave the land of the heathen, which was the land of Assyria, and uh, you see Syria up there. That's that's the land of Assyria. You see Iraq. All of that was Assyria in the Bible day. They said that we're going to leave and we're going to cross the Euphrates and we're going to go to a land that has never been inhabited, where we can keep the commandments that we never kept when we were in our homeland of Israel. They said the journey would take a year and a half, a year and a half journey, and we'll get to the place where we can relax and practice uh, Judaism or the laws um, the, way we practice, the way we didn't practice them in Israel. So now if you see Assyria, you see the border of Assyria, Going through Assyria is the, um, the Euphrates because in the book of Edris it says we're going to cross the Euphrates River and we're going to go to a land that has never been inhabited. It is a year and a half journey. So we know that they were traveling south because the Euphrates River is south and they said the name of the land would be Esherith. So we have been Scholars have been arguing over what Eshereth is and where is Eshereth. Some say that Eshereth is Saudi Arabia, well, Arabia, and then some say Eshereth is the United States. But it said a year and a half journey, and I break it all down in the book to talk about how long a year and a half journey would be for the ancient migration. They traveled nine and a half miles a day. And I talk about if they were going to keep the commandments that they didn't keep when they were in Israel, which they believe that's the reason that they were held in exile in Assyria. They would have kept the Sabbath day. So they would have traveled six days, rested on seven. And that breaks it down. That eliminates 78 Sabbath days. So that limits the amount of time that they traveled 
Suffice it to say that if they're traveling nine and a, nine and a half miles per day for a year and a half, if you subtract the 78 Saturday, that equals 4,500 miles. 4,500 miles, if you're traveling um, southeast, it would take you to Nigeria. In fact, Ibuland, Nigeria. That's not so far-fetched that the 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel migrated from Assyria to Ibuland, Nigeria, and it's not far-fetched. And the reason it's not far-fetched is because the Ibus of West Africa, of Nigeria, they are the oldest known Hebrew community in the world. And I firmly believe that the Ibus of, of, of Nigeria are the descendants of some of the 12, of, of, of part of the 10 tribes of Israel. I believe that now. And I back it all up with research and looking at that type of thing. Now, during the African, the West African slave trade, our African ancestors were brought over to the Americas and well, actually to, to the Caribbeans and to the United States. They were, they were brought over here for the sole purpose of slavery. One of the foremost authors, Daniel Liss, he argues, he is the specialist on Jewish evil identity. He said that one third of the people who were brought from Africa to the States for slavery were Ibus, Ibu Nigerians, who were the descendants of the 10 tribes, the 10 lost tribes of Israel. They landed here in the United States in slavery, and many of us are the descendants of the Ibu Nigeria, uh, Ibu Nigerians, which would make us, some of us, the descendants of 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And when you hear people talking about their uh, Hebrew uh, identity or their Israelite identity, that's what they are referring to. We have traced it back and the DNA is lining up as well. Zondervan, an international media and publishing company's Bible Compact Dictionary, published in 1967, separates the Negroes from Noah's son, Ham. The youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of the eight persons to live through the flood, he became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. Centuries before the writings of this one publishing company, many have known that the people taken from West Africa are the bloodline descendants of Shem. Now let's travel south to Savannah, Georgia, and take a look at its history. When the night dudes has come to do, and the land is dark, and the moon is the only light that you see. Oh, yeah. No, I won't be afraid. No, no, I won't be afraid. Say just a lot as you stand by me. In Savannah, Georgia, the slaves had to make bricks to construct many of the buildings that still exist today. These valuable bricks cannot be replicated. In the book of Exodus, just like the first bondage in Egypt, the slaves had to make their own bricks. This first bondage lasted well under 300 years. Savannah is considered the place where the first African Baptist church was located. This church was built by slaves. They built their church near the river where they could help others to escape. The church also had secret pathways to get out without being seen. What's interesting is that they built a tabernacle in the church and used the same kind of wood that was used to build the Ark in Noah's day and the Ark of the Covenant. The original pews are preserved in the upper level of this historic church. Some historians and linguists believe that the writings on the pews contain Semitic languages, which include the Hebrew language. This language was written in the 1800s, 
but is no longer spoken or written amongst modern Semitic languages today, and therefore they are unable to interpret what was written. Our ancestors came here with their own language and would have preserved it quietly amongst their own people for many years. Why did our ancestors who came through the transatlantic slave trade get sold into slavery? Why would our creator allow this to happen? Amos 3.2, from among all the families on the earth, I have been intimate with you alone. That is why I must punish you for all your sins. Yahweh is holy and he gave instructions of how we should live and what we should not do. In the first 14 verses of Deuteronomy 28, God or Yahweh says that if we would obey his commands, that all would go well and we would be blessed. In verse 15 and throughout the rest of the chapter, Yahweh talks about all the things that will happen if we disobey. Deuteronomy 28, 15, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, then all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Deuteronomy 28, 68, the King James Version says, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. The term no man shall buy you meant that if someone was sold, a family member or someone could bring them back, freeing them from bondage. What Yahweh is saying is that the children of Israel would go back into bondage, but this time in ships. The term Egypt means bondage. When the children of Jacob were in bondage the first time, it didn't start out that way. They freely walked into the land of Egypt and lived there comfortably with the Egyptians. It wasn't until after all the 12 sons of Jacob died that the Egyptians started to oppress them and enslave them. According to the book of Jasher, mentioned in Joshua and 2 Samuel, the Israelites were in bondage for 230 years. In Genesis, God told Abraham that his descendants would be oppressed for 400 years. Slaves coming from the African shores to the United States came in 1619. 2019 marked 400 years that the African Americans have been in this country. The first small group of Israelites that landed in the United States came to Virginia and then more would follow, later to be sent throughout the country. Our Israelite brothers and sisters also went to such countries as Brazil, Jamaica, Haiti, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Guyana, Honduras, the Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, Mexico, the Virgin Islands, Trinidad, Colombia, and many more who were scattered throughout the four corners of the world. The Hebrew slaves would endure crimes against humanity that were carried out by many nations involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Deuteronomy 28, 36 through 37, the Lord will exile you and your king to a nation unknown to you and your ancestors. There in exile, you will worship gods of wood and stone. You will become an object of horror, ridicule, and mockery among all the nations to which the Lord sends you. The Hamitic people and the Shemitic people, who are the descendants of Shem, knew one another and lived close to each other. Throughout the nations where we have been scattered, we have been the object of ridicule and mockery. And the nations that we have been scattered into are fists, <laughs> Not only are they fierce, but they have taken everything away from us. They have stripped us of our, our identity. We no longer know who we are. We no longer know where we belong. Now we have other nations that come into this country, and, and each one of them could trace their identity. And each one could go back to where their roots are. Where do we come in? Where is our roots? Our identity was stripped away from us. 
The term Grecian has also been used to mean Gentile. Joel 3, 6, the King James Version, The children of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Psalms 83, 4, They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And that's exactly what has happened. We have been cut off from being one nation, Israel, and have been scattered to many foreign nations, and we don't know who we are. Deuteronomy 32, 26. I said, I would scatter them into the corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Deuteronomy 28, 43 through 44. The stranger that is within thee shall get above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Pretty much a permanent underclass in America by the year 2015. Why the year 2015? 2015, because what, I, what I've concluded from analysis is that there are going to be a converging of, of social factors nationally and internationally that's going to place blacks in a permanent status of underclassship. And one, we, we anticipate by that point in time, based on all the research that's coming to us, that the next generation of whites going to be more anti-black than they've been since the Civil Rights Movement. Two, we anticipate, by the same token, about 86 million Hispanics coming into the United States and about 41 million Asians by that point in time, mm -hmm. which is going to kick black folk out of being the majority minority in the society, mm -hmm. uh, down to a minority minority. We've been number two in the society for 400 years as a group. We're going to become number four. And, uh, and if we have not gotten anything after being number two for 400 years, you guess what's going to happen when we become number four? Because at that point in time, all the new groups coming into America, they're coming in higher than we are because this country operates off of a preferential acceptance program, mm -hmm. which means that groups are coming in based on skin color, they're going from the lightest down to the darkest, light, yellow, brown, black. And that's what our immigration laws are based on. And black folk would not be able to penetrate through those groups to get to the white society uh, when that happens because those groups owe us nothing. They don't understand our problems and they are competitive with us and we don't begin to be a little more aggressive about being in a competitive posture. They're going to eat our lunches. Black people have been consigned to the lowest level of America's ranking order of social and, ec uh, and economic acceptability. 99 and one half percent of everything of value in the country was maldistributed into everybody's hand except black folk. Black folk have been locked into one, only one half or one percent of anything of value of this country now for over 460 years. It is impossible, um, Rock, in, in, in comparative and theoretical terms for blacks to be a competitive people can't be done. You can't make it off of one half of one percent in a nation that is, comp is a competitive society where people are competing. They, they can't compete. What are they going to compete with? Deuteronomy 28, 48, you will serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you. You will be left hungry, thirsty, naked, and lacking in everything. The Lord will put an iron yoke on your neck, oppressing you harshly until he has destroyed you. In the King James Version of Deuteronomy 28, 49, it says, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. A fierce and heartless nation that shows no respect for the old and no pity for the young. A Washington Post article about Isaac Franklin and John Armfield is titled, They Were Once America's Cruelest, Richest Slave Traders. Why does no one know their names? It is said that Franklin and Armfield, who headquartered their slave trading business in a townhouse that still stands in Alexandria, Virginia today, sold more enslaved people, separated more families, and made more money from the trade than almost anyone else in America. According to the Smithsonian Magazine, between the 1820s and the 1830s, the two men reigned as the undisputed tycoons of the domestic slave trade. Deuteronomy 28, 59 through 61. Then the Lord will overwhelm you and your children with indescribable plagues. These plagues will be intense and without relief, making you miserable and unbearably sick. 
He will afflict you with all the diseases of Egypt that you feared so much. You will have no relief. The Lord will afflict you with every sickness and plague there is, even those not mentioned in this book of instruction, until you are destroyed. There are many diseases today that Black people suffer and die from at a much higher rate than other groups. Food crops can be engineered right now based on existing technology to cause infertility in black people alone. That technology is a reality. It's actually, it's widely covered out there in the mainstream media, in the science media, RNA interference technology is widely covered. And they openly talk about how it can be used to target specific physiological processes of certain insect species. They can interfere with uh, uh, DNA repair or protein synthesis in insects. They can interfere with fertility or reproduction. They can interfere with uh, mobility, a nervous system interaction with, with the musculoskeletal system or depending on what animal we're talking about, other systems, endoskeleton systems. I ask you, does that technology exist? The answer is yes. It absolutely exists right now. Are they using that technology? I ask you, do a little bit of research, look at the plummeting sperm production in black men. Sperm production is plummeting in black men. Sperm production is precisely the kind of physiological process that can be targeted by RNA interference technology. Now, is that proof that the food crops are being engineered to cause sperm production to plummet in black men? No, it's not proof. But when you connect the dots of all the other things that are being done covertly, this becomes something very likely in the realm of possibility. It would take a lot of advanced testing to find this out. And guess who controls the funding? Guess who controls nearly all the science funding in America today? The federal government. The same government that allows the CDC to cover up the truth about vaccines and black children. The same government that funds Planned Parenthood abortions of black babies. The same government that covers up the EPA-induced contamination of waterways affecting Native Americans and other populations, including the Flint, Michigan, predominantly black population. This government, same government that runs the FBI, that won Martin Luther King Jr. to commit suicide. This is the, it's the same government. The government is at war with you, if you're, if you're black and you're watching this, the government is at war with you and they want you exterminated and they control the science funding, which means there will never be money for any genetic science of the food supply to uncover this truth if it were there. It would be covered up like everything else has been covered up this entire time. Just like the Tuskegee experiments covered things up in the 1930s. Nothing has changed except the technology is more advanced the covert technology is more covert. The number of vectors through which they can kill you and cause you to have no children, cause you to have spontaneous abortions, the number of vectors is increasing. You are being targeted. Deuteronomy 28, 64 through 66. For the Lord will scatter you among all the nations from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship foreign gods that neither you nor your ancestors have known, gods made of wood and stone. There among those nations you will find no peace or place to rest, and the Lord will cause your heart to tremble and your eyesight to fail and your soul to despair. Your life will constantly hang in the balance. You will live night and day in fear, unsure if you will survive. Isaiah 42, 22 but his own people have been robbed and plundered, enslaved, imprisoned, and trapped. They are fair game for anyone and have no one to protect them, no one to take them back home. This is one of America's most notorious prisons. You ain't even drink clean water. How are we supposed to drink water? Parchman Prison sits in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. It's a little bit of trade. Yeah. Over a century, it's earned a reputation for racism, brutality, and neglect. 
We need some help in here! We need some help in here! These scenes of a system already in crisis were captured before the global spread of COVID-19. Bears are dying at alarming rates, and conditions are spiraling out of control. No water. Oh, no. Inmates use smuggled cell phones to send distress signals. We need help. And document the conditions they're living in. No mat, no toothbrush, no soap, no food. It's a living monument to the horrors of America's worst prisons and the lasting legacy of slavery. Who are we supposed to cry to? Who are we supposed to call on when things are like this? Which begs the question. How can you fight for your right to basic human dignity when you're locked up in prison? Now the king, power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In terms of what struck me when I walked into the federal prison for women in Danbury, Connecticut, as an incarcerated woman, was uh, to see a sea of predominantly black and brown women who were being warehoused in a prison. Deuteronomy 28, 68, then the Lord will send you back to Egypt and ships to a destination I promise you would never see again. What other nation of people have been taken away in ships and dispersed throughout the nations to be sold into slavery, trapped in enemy territory with no homeland and prison, lost their heritage and identity? No other group has this been done to but the Hebrews hidden oceans away by the transatlantic slave trade. Identity is important because God, Yahweh, made it important when he listed numerous times in scripture people's lineage, especially the bloodline descendants of Jacob. Yes, our identity as believers in Christ is important, and yet our creator wants us to know who we are as the children of Jacob. He wants us restored to him and not follow the sinful and pagan practices of the nations around us. No longer should we allow others to control the narrative, to control our story. Our identity has always been based on what someone told us who we were, and we subscribe to it. And when you tell somebody who you are from a perspective that it benefits the person who's telling you, and it's the narrative is consistently bombarded on you, then that becomes your truth. And so trying to get somebody to see a different perspective, which is the real truth, now you have to start doing something very specific. You have to start recognizing that you were not discerning. You didn't pay attention to what somebody was trying to tell you or saw the agenda that was happening. You were asleep. And when you wake up, you have to admit, oh my God, I let these people do this to me. Or I let this ideology infiltrate my mind, and now I, I'm not a free thinker. So with this, with this new understanding of who we really are, it causes you to be a free thinker, independent of what society has said was who we are. And so, man, when you have to be responsible for your own thinking process and become, you know, become a critical thinker, Nobody wants to do that because many people aren't on the same boat and you don't want to be ostracized. So it's safer to stay where you used to be, even though it's wrong. It's like a bad relationship. You're like, I, 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 he treat me bad, but you know, I know what he's capable of. I don't know what's out there. You know, so we stay in these, these not so empowering experiences because it's comfortable. It doesn't require any work. It doesn't require any self-exploration. It doesn't require any analytical thinking. We want to just kind of just be. People around the world know their lineage and are proud of where they come from. Former President Barack Obama can stand firm on his identity. Is there hope? Yes. Yahweh tells us in 2 Chronicles 7.14 that then if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Yahweh says that his people are called by his name. This may mean that Yahweh's name is part of or contained in the Hebrew names of Israel or specific names. For example, Judah in Hebrew is Yehuda. 
God also tells us in Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 3, in the future, when you experience all these blessings and curses I have listed for you, and when you are living among the nations to which the Lord your God has exiled you, take to heart all these instructions. If at that time you and your children return to the Lord your God, and if you obey with all your heart and all your soul all the commands I have given you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. He will have mercy on you and gather you back from all the nations where he has scattered you. We don't know when these things will happen. Therefore, what we need to understand now is that it's our responsibility to ask for forgiveness and plead to be accepted back as his sons and daughters who are the bloodline descendants of Jacob, whose name was changed by Elohim to Israel. A Hebrew Israelite is not a religious belief such as Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, etc., but rather it is a group of people who you are related to. We are a nation of people whose father Abraham and Isaac were Hebrews, and their son, our father Jacob's name was changed by Yahweh to Israel, creating a separate nation from Abraham and Isaac's other children. But what about the black leadership and our spiritual leaders? Our focus should be on our creator, whom some refer to as God, Elohim, Yahweh, and Yahuwah. Study scripture and research for yourself. Leaders can lead you away from the truth and keep you in physical, mental, and emotional bondage. I think the Black leadership has capitalized on the fact that we're asleep. And I believe that to be true because the Black leadership has still treated us the same way with the guise of being for us, but we haven't benefited or we're not benefiting from that presence. If anything, there's a benefit for them creating the platform, but we know that there's a puppet master behind the scenes not allowing us to ever really accentuate what it was supposed to be about. If that was the case, then we would have more opportunity. You know, we're, we're, we used to be on, in the conversation, political conversation. We're not even in political conversations anymore, which means we don't matter. We matter even less than we did when we had the Malcolm X's and the Martin Luther King's. But when you talk about the other organizations, if that is a collective opportunity for us to be seen, the light is not shining. And so I can't say in good conscience that the Black leadership or the lack thereof has benefited in any way. I believe that individuals within those circles have benefited individually, but it has not translated into us being better, stronger, faster, or whatever you want to say, that we should be as a result of their, their existence. We will individually answer to Yahweh. We individually have to ask for forgiveness and we individually are responsible to seek direction from Yahweh. Leadership will not stand with you before God. We need to seek Yahweh and his direction. We need to pray for healing and walk in the truth of our identity. We need to encourage one another to work together for unification. We need to support our communities, businesses, and inner cities. We should uplift and support the poor, the orphans, widows, and brokenhearted. We should give generously to our communities and people in need. So God allowed all these things to happen to his people. But what about the nations where we were sent? Throughout scripture, there has always been consequences for evil. Each empire that enslaved or oppressed Yahweh's people was brought to destruction. In Deuteronomy 32, 35, God says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back. In due time, their feet will slip, their day of disaster will arrive, and their destiny will overtake them. Romans 12, 18 through 19 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, 
I will repay, says Yahweh. This does not say you can't defend yourself. It means don't plot that God the Almighty sees all and will revenge all in his own time. Remember, the Israelites defeated their enemies many times through the power of El Shaddai, the Almighty God. No political party or group of people can change our circumstances. Rather, we need to focus all our attention with all of our heart on our Creator. Yahweh wanted His people to know Him and who they are. Anyone telling you it doesn't matter, remember what Jesus, Yahshua, said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Satan is the author of lies, so when truth is missing or hidden, you are living a lie. John 8, 44, and the New International Version says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Or as a people, are we Africans in America? Are we Pan-Africans? Are we Moors? Are we Nation of Islam? Who is our nationality? What is our flag? What is our constitution? What are our, by what are our by bylaws? What are our values? Galvanizing all of our leaders in one place at one time to vote on our nationality, our flag, our values, and have a black vote day in real life. Can we do that? because we haven't been officially classified as a nationality. African-American is not a nationality. Black is not a nationality. Our lineage may not matter to our leaders, family members, friends, or others, but it absolutely matters to the Creator. Although we are scattered throughout the world, we need to clarify who we are. The children of Scripture, the descendants of Jacob, the children of Israel, we need to stand together as one nation of people who uplifts, supports, and encourages our Israelite communities around the world and the Americas, the Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, including all those still in some of the African countries and other parts of the world. Remember that it was our ancestors who had the responsibility of spreading the gospel to the nations. Let's continue to share the good news to all nations about the gospel message of Jesus the Messiah, or in Hebrew, his name is Yeshua HaMashiach. And truth is always important. And growing up, those of us who grew up in church, and we've watched all of the, the, the movies that depict the Bible, uh, the people of the Bible, we've seen the Ten Commandments, we've seen King of Kings, we've seen the Passion of the Christ, we've seen all of these movies. And then we've seen depictions in our Sunday school literature at our church, our VBS literature in our churches. And then we walk into the supermarket and we see, uh, especially during the holiday seasons, Christmas and Easter in particular, we see the glossy magazines with images of God, images of Christ, images of the people of the Bible, and all of them are white. Um, and it sort of excludes us from the story. And that was done intentionally so that this is empowering because we see ourselves in the stories. Uh, it doesn't change the Bible, but it changes how we understand it. And it is empowering when we come to the reality that our people are the authors and the characters of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So now when you read it, you read it with fresh eyes, you read it with a different hermeneutic and a different understanding, and we see ourselves as a part of the story. Acts 13, 46 through 47. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. And so let us carry out his command to love Yahuwah Elohim and live in all his ways. We ask 
ask for forgiveness for the wrong that we have done. Please accept us back as your daughters and your sons. And your sons. We surrender what we cannot please. Instead, we come humbly on our knees, waiting for direction, trusting your protection. With borders no more, free to explore, your love forevermore. Y'all has made us a place where we can stand with them face to face. And all creation belongs to you. It all belongs no one to you. Else can do what you choose. All the things you do. not just a figment of mind. It was given before there was time. By our the almighty divine. Yeah. Today and always, we give you the praise, we give you the praise, let you so be, hoping you will you see, see that you we're here. Accept us back as your daughters and your sons.